with um, hold on, uh, uh, with with all this complexity of the seismic assessment uh, of uh, of tsunami potential, uh, people have thought sort of logically that uh, why don't we start using tsunami data uh, to assess the tsunami potential and. Uh, one of the first uh, who, who, was, who was doing it was uh, Kenji Satake, and back in um, 1984, I think he published uh, um, one of the first papers, uh, but, but there's a series of papers there where he used uh, uh, tsunami measurements at the coast, and there were a handful available at that time. Uh, the, the tide gauges on the coast measured wave amplitudes and they measured tsunami amplitudes pretty well. So he used that records of tsunami to try to invert to see, uh, well, he, Kenji is a seismologist, so he's interested more in the, was, I mean, he's, he's both, he's a very well known tsunami scientist also, uh, uh, but, but I think his first head was seismology. So he was mostly interested in the earthquake zones so, so the, the, the origin of the earthquake. So he was trying to see if he could <clears throat> learn something uh, uh, about, um, uh, about, about, about earthquakes by, by measuring the tsunami. So the way he's done it uh, is he, you know, he divides, it's, it's, it's fairly similar to the final fault solution that's, that's employed now with the seismic wave for the seismic wave. Uh, he subdivided the fault, potential fault, in, into uh, into uh, uh, subsections, and generated uh, uh, separate solutions, tsunami solutions, using tsunami model uh, from each of these subsections. And these are Green's functions, uh, if you will, and then come, you know, come up and, and, and try to come up with the approximation of the observation on land. Uh, as a combination of these Green's functions. And uh, if you do it with several of them, uh, with several tag gauges and with several um, uh, sections of the subfold, uh, you will come up with a series of linear equations um, that you see on the bottom uh, here, uh, where uh, the, uh, the, the, the B sub i's uh, are the uh, the, the, the measurement time series, these are nouns. And uh, uh, A, you know, the matrix A is uh, the, the, the matrix of the, um, uh, uh, of the uh, Green's functions. And you need to solve these equations to find X sub J's with the, uh, which are the, the magnitudes of the subfolds. So you can, uh, or, or the so instead of uh, just the 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 one CMT solution, which is a point source solution, you can find the distribution of uh, of this of 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 this sleep sleep distribution along the the non uh, in, along the finite fault, and, um, and and that was quite quite a novel approach at that time. So he's done, so he, he, I mean, this 1983 tsunami in Sea of Japan was his first uh, 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 attempt to do that. And there was, as you can see the data on the right, uh, uh, on the right upper uh, half is the comparison of this, uh, of the data, which he, you know, uh, uh, massaged pretty well because it's all this, uh, uh, data is not digital, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's all paper recordings that he had to work with. And that's compared with this combination of this, of, uh, of the Green's functions. So the best solution that he has. So, uh, I mean, the way he's, he solved it is with the uh, least square root uh, uh, approach uh, uh, for, for the XJs. And he could come up with the distribution of the source along the fault. It's, you know, it, it's, it's a great approach. There's, the problem with that, there, there are three main problems with this approach. So we, we for again, this was 1985, right? Uh, uh, the computers uh, are prolific, but but we don't have, the, you know, to, the personal computers have started to to take off. Um, the computer power is limited, so this the metrics size for the inversion is limited. 
for the for the uh, approximation. Uh, this is one problem one. Uh, the uh, number two, the, the data itself, uh, the tide gauges. Uh, they again, they, uh, they they were all analog stations at the time. Uh, uh, definitely not real time data. Uh, so uh, the, the but, but the main problem with this data is that the, the tight gauges are usually placed at the locations uh, deep inside the harbors. The reason for that is that because they want to uh, 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 to sh to, uh, to shield the the tight gauge from the force of the wind waves, which can be pretty pretty powerful and can just destroy the instrument. But it's the worst place you want to measure the tsunami with. I mean, yes, that's where tsunami amplifies, but the harbors usually, pro it's a very enclosed bodies of water that they resonate with, with their own frequency. So there's, they act like a, as, as a filter, if you will. So there is embedded filter in every single uh, uh, time series that you try to invert for. And, and, and the third problem, of course, it's not a real time, I mentioned that already. So it's, you, you cannot use this method for the real time assessment again, you know, for me, it's it's fairly important. But while it's not the only one uh, goal for the uh, tsunami inversion problems, it's 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 a very important part of the uh, of the tsunami uh, data simulation and data data inversion. So there's actually there's one more problem. It, it, it's the, the quality of the solution, of course, of the inversion depends on the quality of the model that you use to generate this to generate these Green's functions. Which are the direct uh, the direct propagation problem of the tsunami, and these were fairly crude. I have to say that's that's exactly when when I started to to get into the tsunami, and and the modeling was my specialty, uh, and still is. Um, uh, and and I know that the models were fairly crude, but the scientists, you know. We, we, the, the community definitely saw the advantage of this uh, or, or the benefits of this approach and 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 it it really took it to heart to to perfect it to like to take all these three problems and try to you know to improve those the models the data and the speed of the of how how fast you can you can do these calculations so the 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 um, there's this little graph that i i put together sort of the the, the timeline of tsunami forecast evolution. They said back in, even before that, 1975, the state of the art uh, uh, model that I like to show um, it was, was, was the one that you see on the, on the left. You see, it's actually it's an animation of the, of the tsunami wave hitting Hawaii Island. If you, you, you see the, the resolution there, uh, it, it's definitely was state of the art. It's actually the author of this is Eddie Bernard. He was director of our lab for a long time. Uh, uh, and you can see, you know, how much the computer can can hold in terms of the data. Fast forward to the end of the century, uh, to 2000, the same exact model. Like he's using the shallow water wave equations. So the model, I mean, in terms of the the mathematics, is virtually the same. But if you improve the solution, improve the data, uh, and visualization too, you can come up with the model that look you know, very much like the real tsunami. And that's, you see on the right, and that's the uh, tsunami, the, the simulation of the tsunami of 1980, 1993 in Japan, uh, that, that killed over 200 people in this little peninsula called Aonai Peninsula. And that's what you see the animation of the tsunami for here. And what it took uh, the community, um, to, 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 you know, to move from the 1975 type models to 1989. Well, the computers, yes, definitely. More slow holds pretty well still, you know, the computer capacity, you know, uh, doubles in about two years. Um, that's, that's true. So you can put more data into there, but it also uh, more, more sort of more uh, uh, resolution into the, into the model, but, but it also, uh, 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 took a lot of data that the tsunami community uh, uh, started to digging for, start to dig for during this what's called the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction, which started in 1990. Uh, and the tsunami community took it to heart to take all possible data 
from any tsunami that they can put it, put put their hands on. And these uh, uh, little dots, red dots uh, along the line, the timeline, are the tsunami events that you know this the tsunami community form formed this um, uh, 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 tsunami sort of fast response team where uh, the, the after every, you know every sizable tsunami is the group of scientists will will go and collect all the data possible so that we can uh, uh, benchmark the models and and uh, and make sure that the models behave uh, uh, in such a way that they can simulate the actual event and that paid off you know this this model that you see on the right is uh, has compared it's not it's not only looked pretty pretty uh, pretty you know much better than the previous the previous model you know previous century models <laughs> Um, or pre previous decade models, it actually compares pretty well with the data. Uh, and that's the reason is that, that we collected, and, and I was part of this uh, fast response team in, in, in some of the events, we collected all possible data and the, the, the data is fairly perishable. You, you see some, uh, some uh, uh, the, the ways that you collect it, uh, you actually you know, go along the coast and collect all possible tsunami uh, you know, sort of amplitudes that, that live uh, that that can be inferred from the marks that tsunami leave on the coastlines, and these are very perishable, so you have to go there fast. So that was that was huge uh, 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 advancement. At the same time, the data side, the real time data side, was being developed also. You know, this the timeline on the bottom here shows. Uh, the, the, the timeline, the, the, the development of this um, uh, tsunami specific measurement device uh, that, that was actually done in our lab, which was really the, the our lab initiative initially uh, first, and it started in about 1990s, early 90s. Uh, the, the, the instrument that you put in the deep water uh, to, that can detect tsunami and provide measurements that is useful for models, which we call it deep ocean assessment and reporting for tsunami and DART for short. And that's a very sophisticated de de design. It, it, it probably takes a whole new uh, uh, presentation to, to describe it. Uh, but, but, uh, but that took a long time. So the, uh, the, 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 the decade of, uh, uh, of, of natural disaster reduction, uh, uh, took us to improve the accuracy of the model. But then the next decade, uh, or the, the decade after that, really was uh, the decade that we put all this accuracy, all these new sophisticated models into action to provide the forecast, not only accurately, but fast. And the reason for that was uh, this big tsunami that, that occurred in 2004 in, in Sumatra, offshore Sumatra, the Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, the Boxing Day tsunami of December 26, it's, uh, it, it engulfed the whole Indian Ocean, uh, uh, it's, uh, but, but actually it reached out to the whole world ocean. And uh, what you see here is the animation of the model that we've come up uh, in, in our shop uh, very shortly after the tsunami. Well, very shortly at that time was several hours after the earthquake. Uh, but even that, and, and, and that was uh, based on pretty much just one, well, there was the, some scattered uncertain earthquake data, uh, not really a CMT solution at that time. Oh, actually, yeah, there was a CMT solution, but the CMT solution was about uh, 10 times less energy of the earthquake uh, estimated than there actually was, because it was huge earthquake. It was, uh, you know, eventual magnitude that the Milokal uh, estimated by the the, the, earth, the earth body waves uh, 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 was about 9.3, and initial estimates were about about 8.2 or something like that. The, the very initial estimate I remember it very well because I was I was there trying trying to model that. So the, the model that you see here it was was scaled by just one data point. There was the uh, Cocos Island uh, uh, tide gauge, not far from uh, uh, from the epicenter, and at that reported the the tsunami tsunami wave in real time, and I used that to scale this uh, this this solution and uh, uh, to to what it was. 
even then it wasn't known how accurate the solution was, but uh, so it was very crude model, but the, the demand for this model was huge, which showed that the forecast is really needed and, and we actually can do that. What's missing is the data. The only data that, that was verified this forecast in somewhat was the satellite altimetry data, uh, which was obtained actually for, you know, very fortuitously about two hours after the event, uh, the JSON topics, you know, two sort of paired satellites uh, flew over the area, as you see on the top, the trajectory, I mean, the trajectories of the satellites and the altimetry data that they provided in black. And that black line that you see here on the plot is, is very much massage data. It's, there's a lot of, you know, filtering, uh, uh, detailing, uh, 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 and, and, and other, uh, uh, things done with this data before it can be, it became useful for, for, for comparison at this point. In fact, we used it for, um, for version two, but first the comparison and the blue line sort of shows the, the model data that, that, that you see here. And it, 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 it looks, you know, it looks like in deep, in deep ocean, we, we, cut, we, we get the data pretty well. And what it, you know, as it turned out later, this was, fairly good model, you know, generally speaking of this event. Again, so what that showed is that what we do have the models that can be used. We don't have the data that can be used for the real time forecast. And that's, you know, that's when this development of the uh, deep ocean assessment and reporting for tsunamis, this DART system started to pay off. It was really, uh, you know, just uh, the initiative of PML, but it, it has become the worldwide uh, uh, demand for uh, uh, for this data and the data, uh, this instrument actually measures the pressure, the static pressure at the bottom of the ocean and the tsunami wave since they involved the whole movement, the, the movement of the whole uh, column of water, uh, they change the static pressure and the pressure instrument is sensitive enough to uh, detect even one centimeter tsunami, not only detect but resolve it with good enough accuracy that, that, that we can use it in, uh, in data simulation. Now, to use this data, uh, again, this data is only as good as, as, as you can, uh, as, as, as far as the model can use that. And the way we use the model is very similar to what Sataka has suggested for the tag gauges. It's uh, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you build the Grins functions uh, and uh, 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 that, that, that you try to approximate this DART data with, the linear combination of the Green's functions. Uh, and then by using the, uh, some minimization technique, you try to minimize the error that, uh, I mean, so the, the mismatch between the uh, Green's, fun Green's function combination and the actual solution. And uh, the, you know you can use different minimization techniques, but the least square method provides you with the, with the very uh, fast uh, uh, estimate. And then it, it, the, this L2 norm has a very good qualities that you can use to, to provide you know, robust and fast. Uh, and fast is the keyword here because the DART was really designed for the fast estimate uh, 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 minimization technique. So, pretty much the same uh, uh, this square method as the, that Sataki has used for the tag gauges. <clears throat> we used it for, uh, uh, for, for dark data to come up with the source. And to, again, we, we try to do it fast. Remember that we, you know, the uh, science is great, but we want to use the science for the, um, uh, for the actual practical applications to, to, come, to, to reduce the time we decide, you know, we, we pre-compute all these um, uh, Green's functions because they, you know, every Green's functions is actually it's the full propagation solution from uh, from the portion of the fault, right? So these uh, uh, red squares that you see, and these are red squares, it's too magnified. Uh, these are this uh, uh, portion of the faults that are used to compute the Green's functions. And Green's function is the full propagation, you know, action fact, the global propagation of a tsunami we call, uh, uh, for, from, from this Green's function we call it unit source because we, you know, these are the source with the unit, uh, mag uh, with the unit slip uh, that we come up 
with about 150, 150 by 50 kilometer size of this rectangle, that gives you about you know 7.5 approximate approximate uh, about 7.5 magnitude earthquake. So you combine those and scale those uh, by using the dark data, which are the yellow triangles here, and it, it's a modern uh, constellation of dark data. Uh, most all of uh, almost all of them are here. Uh, and then you can come up with the source of the tsunami fairly quick. The, the reason the dark data is so useful is that the, the tsunami wave propagates very fast in deep water. So they actually, you, you see the, we, you know, they're, they're, they're in deep water, uh, fairly far away from potential sources. But in most cases, the dark data gets, uh, 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 gets tsunami faster than tsunami hits the land anywhere because it propagates so much faster in the deep water. So that's, that's and that's how the, 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 the idea of tsunami forecast has come about, you know, combine, combining a few things, you know, historical knowledge of, the, of, the, of, of where potential tsunamigenic earthquakes occur. And that's, we were talking about earthquakes still. So that's the, the, the dot here is, uh, you know, the lines are potential, you know, big uh, uh, faults, that are known, and these faults are usually the the borders, uh, the, the 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 plate plate boundaries. And uh, from historical database, we see where tsunamis historically occurred in the last you know three thousand years or so, and they do occur along these lines. Um, so that's where you put your grids, you know, you, you pre-compute your grids functions first. Uh, uh, and 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 of course you you want to put your detection close to the source so that they, they, we can we can catch the tsunami early and get the data early. And uh, do, over the years again, it started in 2004. In this 15 years, we we went through actually four generations of, of these dark buoys. The principle is still the same, but they you know they they're, they're much better fit for the problem now uh, with all kinds of improvement. And this data is used for the inversion. They, they, this is the Greens functions. You know, these black lines, Greens functions, actually there are much more of those now. We pre-compute these potential sources as, you know, anywhere we can so that we can save time on the computing uh, during, the, during, during the event. And then we use this least square inversion technique to come up with the solution. But then it's not over yet. Again, the forecast is only as good as it, you know, as it accurate at the coast line. At the coastline, if you remember the, the, the movie that I showed you um, at the beginning, the wave becomes very nonlinear. And the linearity that we used to come up with the source of the inversion is not holding up anymore. You, you, know, you cannot Im, Im, imply the linearity when it's close to the source. So we, we have a two step approach, and we should actually have a three step approach. Uh, when you come up with a source and come up with this propagation scenario, of the combined source. We use this scenario as initial conditions for the near shore compu computations of the tsunamis. Uh, so it's very, com you know, sounds very, very, very complex, uh, but, but if you in, in, uh, integrate it into the forecast system, that gives you continuous verification with each tsunami. And since our, you know, start of our development of this system, you know, that uses data, you know, the data inversion for the forecast. This is again, this is our data slide. We have uh, almost up to a hundred different events that we have data for. And we use every event to improve the system. You know, we, we tweak the, uh, the inversion algorithm. It's, it's, it's the key uh, to assess the source because if you assess the source correctly, then the rest is, is uh, is, is, is as good as the models are. Uh, there's a lot of efforts to improve the models. And there's, uh, uh, it's, again, it's a separate talk, but both propagation and inundation models, uh, there, there have been special efforts put into improving that with the standard set of benchmark established. So we know what models can simulate tsunami good enough so they can be used for the inversion. And putting it all together took a lot of time. <laughs> and that's, a lot of my time has been put into developing this overarching system that includes everything, where inversion is actually the key. 
because I'm the model and I'm still considering myself a model and I know that garbage in, garbage out is a very much true statement for the modeling. You know, the models, you know, are as good as the, the, the data can go into them. And the inversion provides the key step then. Uh, so again, this um, sort of this three, three step approach is you detect tsunami data. I mean, you, you get the tsunami data. Again, the first data is actually not from Dart that's shown here, but is from, uh, from the seismic data. And, and the seismic conversion is already, we assume that's there. Uh, then uh, inverting this data, you get the approximation of the tsunami source, which is this permanent displacement I was talking about before. And you use that as the initial condition for the near coast um, simulation to provide the flooding forecast. And the flooding is, is the main parameter that we're looking for. And to show you what exactly you are trying to forecast, uh, I'm going to show you this video of the uh, March 11, 2011 Japan tsunami. This is what tsunami flooding looks like. I mean, first of all, it doesn't look like this nice curly wave that you usually, you know, see as a tsunami depiction. Um, second of all, you see how much debris uh, uh, you, uh, 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 you, you uh, the tsunami picks up during the propagation. So it's a, it's it's it, it's a fairly complex phenomenon to 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 uh, to uh, simulate this inundation portion. And with all debris there, the force is so tremendous that 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 uh, that you definitely have a problem with with defending this any other way but evacuating people. So uh, to save life, you definitely need to evacuate people from any inundation zone. And this video video is a very good illustration of why you want to evacuate everybody from the flooding, uh, fr from the area of estimated flooding. It's uh, the, as you can see, the, the wave just bulldozed away everything it, it see on its back. Uh, and, and destruction is actually, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. You, you can see the tsunami can bring fires into land also, it, uh, it, as this show uh, very well. Um, so um, it, that's a long video, uh, but you know, maybe just a little bit more portion here that to see the power of this wave, it, it a very little can, can withstand this power. So again, the modeling, which comes after the tsunami inversion and, and proper estimation of the flooding zone becomes the key to, to, to saving lives. So that if you, if you can estimate where you want to, to, uh, uh, to evacuate people from, you can, you can save all lives as, uh, as, as Eddie Bernard has challenged us with. Now, this tsunami, and I'll, I'll, I'll focus a little bit on this tsunami a little, uh, for, 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 for a few minutes, created a lot of challenges. Uh, I mean, we've been developing this system uh, and, and we thought we were on the right path, but it shows the problem, for example, with the tide gauge station for at least the real time uh, uh, inversion, because uh, by that time, many tide gauge stations reported real time data, digital data that you can actually use for uh, uh, theoretically for tsunami inversion, but, but large tsunamis like that, you can see from uh, uh, the east coast of Japan, many tide gauges just flat line. They were simply destroyed by a tsunami. So it's not very reliable data, even, you know, for, especially for the large tsunamis, that's, that's the one that you actually really need this data for. Again, engineering approach, as you can see from the previous video, has a lot of challenges for this for, for, forceful wave like that. Uh, uh, Japan has invested very heavily uh, in uh, for the engineering uh, defensive uh, defenses uh, from tsunamis. It's it's fortified pretty much the whole coast of Japan is fortified with with tsunami walls, you know, special walls that surround the coastlines defending from tsunamis. You can see the remnants from this wall in Kamayashi he, uh, city here on the at the, uh, at the bottom. Uh, these were definitely under designed, definitely under designed. So if you design the wall, you do, and, and if, if it's this wall is overtopped, in fact, uh, it, it, the, the wave in some ways become even worse uh, because the downflow 
becomes much more destructive if there was no way in some ways, although it's not entirely true. I mean, some, so, so anyway, the design of the tsunami wave is, is, is a critical, uh, but, but any wave, there's, there's like, like they say, there's always bigger fish. Yeah, so they, they can always come up with the largest tsunamis and cost benefit becomes very challenging for the engineering approach of tsunami defense. Now, the hazard assessment, the modeling assessment of the tsunami, that's what I want to focus on. That has, has been a big challenge for this tsunami also. What you see here is the, the blue area is what was inferred to be the danger, tsunami danger zones for uh, uh, some for two locations um, uh, on the uh, east coast of Japan. The pink area is what was actually flooded during this event. So you see the people evacuated from the danger zone, some people did, uh, only to get flooded by the wave. And, and that's definitely not what we want in terms of the modeling assessment. Uh, we want the inverse picture to be true. You know, we, we want these two lines actually coincide, that would be the best. But if nothing else, the, it, will be, it should be conservative forecast that the, the danger zone should be, uh, that estimated should be larger than the one that's occurred. So at that time, 2011, uh, we have our, uh, uh, this inversion scheme already in test uh, operations at tsunami warning centers. So we were testing it uh, during, during this event, actually. Um, there were several DART stations, international DART stations uh, in the area. Uh, and the first uh, DART that recorded this wave and I, we, we were watching it real time. Uh, uh, and that, that still is the absolute record of deep ocean uh, tsunami amplitude. We measured it's one point, one went, you know, almost 1.7. It actually was larger than that. This, uh, the, the plot here, uh, the detiding took, you know, a few centimeters of this amplitude. It's almost, you know, all the way to up to two meters. When, when we saw this wave, we thought there was something wrong with the, with, the, with the gauge because we never imagined a tsunami wave that would be that high. Uh, but, but when we realized that it's not, uh, after the second dart uh, de detected almost a half a meter tsunami, also never seen before. If you remember my previous slide, the, the Indian Ocean tsunami, this deep ocean uh, um, uh, satellite altimetry, data showed about 60 centimeter tsunami. And there was a catastrophic tsunami propagating in the Indian Ocean. So we, so we definitely saw something at least that high or probably larger going on. And that's when we, you know, and, and, and we had our uh, least square method of inversion already set up. So we were able to do the inversion based on this area of the, uh, uh, of the data for these two dots. Uh, and that uh, gave us this combination of uh, unit functions. You see these squares. These are pre-computed, you know, grids functions, unit sources. Uh, so a combination of these unit sources gave us that solution in red, which uh, has a pretty good comparison with the data. You know, it, it's 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 fairly good one. So when the the uh, the darts were uh, reported, you know, the, the further out darts reported the tsunami, that was already verification of the solution that we gave, because the, the solution was based on just two darts in the beginning, the US and Russian dart. Um, so that gave us the source, uh, and that happened, and if you, if you remember that, that's about, about you know, a, a, a little more than an hour, about an hour and, and 20 minutes into the event. And in fact, at that time, the magnitude was still stand from the seismic inversion uh, was still something like uh, 8.4, almost uh, order of magnitude less than than the actual magnitude that was uh, for, for this event. But we, since the tsunami data is, you know, we actually measuring the tsunami data that we want to model, we were able to do well. This uh, uh, again, I show this. Uh, the, there was several other inversions was done later. So we compared the inversion that's done for the, with the DART with uh, the seismic inversion that I talked about at the end of the GPS inversion. And, and there was a lot of GPS data in, in, in Japan. 
uh, in fact, the GPS inversion did use the DART data also. And that was done not in real time. It was this proof of concept that was done years later, but we use it for comparison to, to see what, what we can potentially get from the GPS inversion, for example, in combination with DART data and, uh, and, and use it for the forecast. Um, that's what you see here is the, the vertical displacement. That's the source of the tsunami that was uh, invert from the GPS data. Uh, and then some RMS errors there. But also the final fault solution was available, uh, but it was done. I mean, again, it was a, such a complex uh, event. The first final fault solution was, uh, was, a, was available about a day later, about 24 hours later, but it was updated even later to like more robust solution. We compared these three, even though they, they were not real time, we wanted to, to see what's, what's available. And uh, even with all the data that, and, 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 and analysis that went in the GPS and, 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 and find and fault solution, the, the dark data, which was obtained in a, like at this time in the first hour, I mean, within the first two hours was in many ways a, a better fit in terms of the tsunami tsunami model. That's not really too much of a surprise because we use tsunami data to infer the, the tsunami source. Not the, the uh, well, you know, GPS and US data and, and, and uh, the seismic data is looking into the earthquake data. So it's not a direct data comparison, of course. Uh, and when, let's see, I think there was a comparison here. Uh, well, this independent comparison for this data. We used uh, several recordings. Again, it was uh, probably a year later we've done that. Uh, that are close to the coast of Japan. And again, this is the comparison. These three columns show comparison of three different methods. And, and while they both, all three of them showed fairly good uh, uh, flooding forecast, the dart was the fastest and still uh, provided the best uh, amplitude estimates for among, uh, among the three. Again, I wouldn't be too surprised that, 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 that it did because it, it, we use the, the tsunami data for the tsunami model. So it's as simple as that. The problem with, uh, uh, well, especially I mean, if you could just focus on the, where the, the highest amplitudes were, you see that, uh, say, the final fault predicted the, the highest amplitudes in, 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 in sort of in not the same location again. It's, it's difficult to get the asperities right for, the, for the such a large, large and complex source. The GPS inferred data it came up with a bit better distribution of the amplitude, but it took a lot of massaging the data and we're still not sure how to use that. We, we experimented with that. We, we still not have it operational there. Uh, so with the dark data, on the other hand, we were able to get the, to the forecast for the US coastlines, which is a much easier problem because we had few hours in front of them. It was about six hours of tsunami propagation time before the waves hit the first you know, US territory in the US coastline in, in, in Hawaii. And again, I want to remember with the, when I talked about talk about tsunami forecast, we all want to forecast the flooding at the impact of the coastline. Okay. That's the forecast. If we, if, you know, when we come up with the forecast of the, of the next dark data, the dark, dark, you know, location or the source of the tsunami is great, it's scientifically fantastic, practically not really valuable until you get the forecast for, for the coastline. And we've done it with this again, remember this, the third step, when we actually run models in real time, because it's a fairly non, it becomes fairly non-linear while it gets closer to the source, and you have this, you know, uh, high and higher resolution nested grids that zoom onto the harbor level, and what you see here on the lower row uh, was the this highest resolution model in the harbors and several harbors along the, the Hawaiian Islands, and the comparison uh, of the uh, 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 that's that's the forecast. That's what's highlighted is actually the forecast. All the rest was the ways to get to this forecast, and the comparison of the tide gauges that were installed in this on all these harbors. That was one of the criteria for our forecast that they, they should be tide gauge to verify the forecast. Was pretty good, actually. And so we were 
fairly happy with this far field forecast that we provided. And, and that was done for the whole Pacific Ocean. You know, while the tsunami was propagating, uh, this, you know, two dart inversion, it provided pretty good assessment of this, you know, Pacific tsunami propagation. But that highlighted a problem that we have, and then I'll maybe talk a little bit at the end of that, that this inversion is based on just two darn data, just two, you know, and 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 the, the reason it's it's good is probably because we have a lot of assumptions and these assumptions work well for this case. But what it highlights is the problem that the our tsunami inversion is a very data poor problem. We have a very little data, you know, even though we have almost uh, you know almost up to a hundred uh, uh, dart stations around the world, it's still only one, two, maximum three darts that we use for the inversion during the real time, because we just don't have time for more. So, uh, I mean, this, it's changing slowly. I'll, I'll show a little bit about it, but, but still, it's a very data poor uh, problem. So we have to do a lot of assumption there. But it worked well for that tsunami for the US. We've ran all our forecast models for the US coastlines. You see the comparisons here. Not, it's, it's a very uh, uh, sort of busy plot here with a lot of uh, wiggly lines. But just to summarize, we actually did the metric, specific metric for the goodness of the forecast, uh, of the forecast to, to improve the forecast skill. And we see about 70% accuracy in terms of the amplitude assessment of the tag gauge. That's sort of numerical assessment that we're getting at. But, but the good thing is that the larger the tsunami is, the better the, the accuracy is. And the reason is that, you know, if you, for the small signals that we see in, in some of the tide gauges, there's a lot of noise in the tide signal. Remember, I was talking about the, the, the problem with the tide gauge signals for the inversion, because if there's, there's a lot of, you know, uh, filtering going on, uh, which, which we call noise, you know, for us tsunami scientists, it's noise. And the smaller the signal, the, uh, uh, the, the worse this problem becomes. Uh, and uh, so we've, uh, what, what, what this shows is sort of the snapshot of, uh, of the global um, um, uh, as model of this tsunami, of the um, March 11, 2000 tsunami that shows the maximum computed amplitudes at every point uh, uh, of, of the model around the world actually. So the maximum computed amplitudes at every point. So we, we just, we compute the propagation and take maximum at every point. That's the snapshot that you give you. You see that the energy propagates not evenly around the globe. It, it has very, you know, narrow paths of where, where the highest energy uh, is, is, is uh, shot to the coastline. Uh, and we've done it for many tsunamis. Like I said, it's a built-in feature that every tsunami give you the opportunity to perfect your, your, your uh, uh, you know, the, the whole sequence, but mainly the inversion technique. And we've done, it's still list square that we use, but we've done a lot of uh, additional uh, constraints to list squares to improve our forecast. Uh, uh, the problem, I mean, that, that works as you could see fairly well now. We are pretty confident that if tsunami is far away, uh, then the coastlines, uh, you know, a few hours away, we can predict the tsunami amplitude pretty well. But the main destruction and the main problem is near source. That's a tsunami again in Japan, showed that very well. It's, uh, you see the flood on the, on the left. Uh, this is the, the model that telescope into the high and higher resolution and provides the flooding estimates on the left. Uh, that, that is the model that uses the inversion from two darts. Okay, it's the same model. So in principle, it works uh, in terms of the accuracy pretty well because the comparison with data, which, which the, the flooding that was measured is a, is a white, white line and the color uh, sort of fill data shows the model. So it compares fairly well. And the problem is the timing again. Uh, can we do this inversion so fast that, that by the way, this, uh, uh, this flooding occurred about an hour after the event. So, I mean, we, we have some time, 
not much, but some. But but how fast can we do the, the forecast? Again, the forecast is that it's the, the flooding models model that we have to run after the um, uh, the inversion. And if you just do like a little mind exercise, it does take like three to fifteen minutes just to realize that the earthquake of potential danger is going on. Just because the we need we need to collect all the seismic data and and just to get the magnitude the the rough estimate of the magnitude and the location it takes about three minutes uh, but but you know to be certain about 15 minutes to get some estimates of the of, of, of the of the you can't can't get away from that just the the data boundaries the the, the data limit the the speed of the of the seismic rate propagation limit then it takes some time to do the inversion right i mean to, to i mean or to do at least the you know, okay, you do, you do just the seismic inversion, then you put it into the source and do the propagation. And only then you do the, your nonlinear models. It takes another 10 to 15 minutes. You're already an, a, more than 30 minutes uh, away, even without any complications, you know, sort of administrative complications. You're 30 minutes into the event. The wave started to hit closest coastlines. And only then you can probably get the darts that are, that are located right now. So that's the problem. We need to reduce the time. The best way to reduce the time would be to predict when the earthquake occur. If we like few hours away uh, before the earthquake, then we are golden. We we can do it all this cycle, you know, before time, and we we can get perfect forecast in months, you know, before way before the wave hit. That's we we're, we're not there yet. Hopefully, we can get some good earthquake prediction uh, capabilities sometime soon. Uh, not yet. So in, pr in practical, uh, uh, yeah, it's a practical future. It's actually this future is now. We're actually right there. Again, we can't get away from this three to 15 minute initial sort of assessment of the earthquake. But the rest can be reduced pretty well. Computers, again, more slow is on our side. It, it, it gets you, you know, the computers are faster and faster and faster. We actually reduce our computation time in seconds. So the computations are not a bottleneck of this process anymore. We can do it very fast. So uh, the, the, the first assessment can be out in a minute. But if you place the, uh, the data uh, 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 detections, you know, and DART is one of them, I just show example, but there can be others, you know, in strategically locations that are closer, then you can get it even faster. Uh, um, the uh, I'm trying to see if I'm, I'm good on time. Uh, uh, the the uh, and uh, and 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 we can get the forecast technically in ten minutes or fifteen minutes, and that's already before even the closest line is is hit. And if you automate it, all the process, then then we can have the forecast before any you know before any wave hit the coastline and warn people. And get people from the harm's way. You know, it's a theoretical exercise. In practice, it's uh, I mean, just to give you some flavor, what what problems we're facing with. So the tide gauges, you know, there's so many tide gauges that it's really would be good to have the tide gauge as addition to the to the you know throw it into the inversion routine and see if it gives you a better solution. We've tried it; doesn't really work very well. You know, what you see here is the on the on the left is the deep ocean detector, just one. And we see how good of the solution for the, if we invert just this one, one dart uh, to the source. And we see if, when we get good solution for the dart, uh, the same solution computed for the TED gauge there in Pago Pago, it's, it's for one event in, in, a, in the Pacific there in, in Samoa in 2009, become very stable also. This is not the case if you use the tide gauges. For the same thing, so you try to invert the tide gauge signal. It's this, you know, you use the same uh, 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 this square technique. You get the stable solution for the tide gauge, you know, fairly fast, but it doesn't guarantee you the stable solution for the dart, which means your propagation solution is still uh, very uncertain. Putting the tide gauges, say the, the darts close to the source, has its own problems too, because this, you know, the, the darts, which the pressure signal that dart measures, measure the the shaking of the earthquake very well, apparently. And if it's close to the source, 
uh, if it's far from the source, this, the, the seismic waves uh, are separated in time from tsunami. But if you put them closer, you see it's on the, on the right, in the, in the middle frame, you see the black line, which is seismic wave, which is, which is raw signal of the pressure, pressure detector in some time in, in, in uh, somewhere in Japan for the, during the uh, uh, 2011 tsunami. It's completely, tsunami signal completely masked by seismic. Well, you could, the, 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 we, we, can, we can deal with this for the new generation. 4Gs were designed with a filter inside that seems to work pretty well. There are other data. This, this, yeah, I, was, I, was talking, I was saying that they, we have a very data poor problem. It's changing, slowly, but it's changing. There's, and in Japan, for example, there's a massive cable system that's with the same pressure sensors. So instead of uh, sending the data to the buoy and to the satellite, they using the cable data. It's a much more expensive proposition, but 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 it, you can have much more data sent through the cable uh, than through the satellite, and you have a lot of uh, uh, data that 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 the east coast of Japan is is fully instrumented. Uh, you can see the the number of detectors there is enormous. The East Coast, the West Coast of US, the Pacific Coast of US is started to be instrumented in the same way, not anywhere close to the, no, the amount of sensors in Japan. But so the number of sensors is increasing. And that, well, if, even the satellite da data is uh, sort of, we're still investigating it. We're it's, it's not, we, we, we still, <laughs> there's no cigar in terms of the satellites uh, uh, sort of looking down and getting you with the tsunami data. It's not, it's very, very difficult to deal with. And it's not, we're not having geostationary satellites looking down at the ocean yet. These satellites are for different purposes. The altimetry data, they, this, this is, I think it's a fourth generation of altimetry data satellites uh, orbiting now. You have to make sure that the orbit come to the right place at the right time. That doesn't happen all the time. And the data is, is, is very noisy. For tsunami purposes, it's very good for the you know to to look at the different uh, other oceanographic applications, but not for tsunamis yet. But with all this data coming in, new data potentially, uh, you may we we started to look at different you know at, at beyond just the least square feet. Uh, the machine learning applications is is we are only at the beginning of the way there there, there are a few studies that were looking at to that especially and the most of them are focused in japan where this you know huge number of data data points are available now that you can throw well the good thing about the machine learning application they don't care about you know uh, what data you throw into them and and how much data the more data the merrier and not not exactly the case for the least square uh, and some early results are uh, encouraging, not all you know, mind blowing, but encouraging. Uh, you see this on the right uh, frame. It shows the uh, the the forecast in red with the uh, uh, the actual observation uh, in, in in blue, and and it still takes about forty minutes with all this massive amount of data to get this sort of robust forecast of inundation. But it's it's fast developing field. Uh, we we are looking, you know, uh, uh, in the future of machine learning application. There. I want to go back a little bit on the tsunami. Well, well Vasily, I'm very sorry. We have only ten minutes <laughs> to finish. Uh, just uh, uh, could you could you wrap here your talk? I mean, because because it's a okay. question. Ten, so. ten minutes. Okay. okay. Um, the, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, I'm I'm almost there. I'll, I'll just zoom through to to meet your tsunami. Yeah, and, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go to the conclusion slide and question. Uh, the pressure wave can actually be, be also, this is the, the, the left is pressure, the, the, the right is, is the tsunami that's propagating and you can actually do some things with inversion, but that's the summary. I skipped the meteor tsunami. You can write to me with the details so that, and actually I can, I can send you the paper that we've, uh, we've done on that. But in summary, this nature of tsunamis, which are very long waves, and you can model the shallow water wave equations, and they behave pretty linearly in the open ocean, opens up 
you know, a, a good opportunities for the data and for the data inversion techniques, many efficient data inversion techniques, so much so that they can be used in real time. And, and what I showed you is how, you know, we, we use it so far, there's a lot more need to be done to get to this zero casualties from tsunami and the data inversion is the key for that. And a lot of new data is coming up, you know, GNSS data, uh, the satellite altimetry and the machine learning algorithms. So that concludes my talk. Uh, uh, so if you have uh, sort of to make accurate forecast, just add data. <laughs> and if you have questions, I will try to answer those. Okay, thank you very much, Vasily. It's really it's a big topic, and it's a lot of a lot of uh, coverage from your side. It's uh, exciting. Uh, we now have uh, some time for questions. Okay. I see, I see some questions in the chat box. Uh, it's particularly it is written. Isn't for uh, isn't not possible to already simulate numerous models and select the suitable model according to a scenario to save the time just like meteorology people do. Ensemble modeling, absolutely. Uh, there are many models, there are many tsunami models. Ensemble modeling was not, is, 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 is not yet a big thing in the tsunami model. And that's probably, and I, I know the hurricane models, it's all about ensemble modeling. It provides great results. You, you get the uncertainty very well. Uh, the field of the tsunami forecast uncertainty is wide open. So far, it's the, the problem is the very limited time that you have to assess that, and 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 sample modeling is probably the way to do it. Uh, for now, we just optimized one model so much that it runs in seconds. You need to do the same for different other models so you can do ensemble. But yes, good question. Uh, not there yet. <laughs> Okay, uh, one question also is related to actually that which we discussed already very briefly by end of your first part. It's a question related to the earthquakes and tsunami graph uh, from Gusikov. And it's written that it's, we can see that an earthquake with a magnitude of A can generate a tsunami with negative magnitude and positive magnitude. So what can explain this variation? Oh, good, uh, good question. I just zoomed through that. Uh, a lot of things. This uh, I've, <laughs> I I I go back to uh, you know it, it, this quote of Freddie Bernard, who is uh, I mentioned a couple of times. He often called the tsunami generation problem compares the tsunami generation from earthquakes uh, as the scramble egg problem. The, the, you know there are several eggs there, and they all scrambled. You know there's a lot of things going on and, and uh, uh, they're, they're probably, you know, huge mass, you know, uh, uh, land failures going on. The uncertainty of the mechanism that, that Alec was inferring to is, is another, another egg. Uh, the uncertainty of the data is, is another egg too. And, and the, the, the big earthquakes is especially complex omelette, you know, because <laughs> the, it's, 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 the rupture is maybe going on for up to 10 minutes, like for example, for the, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean tsunami. And, but you have to provide the forecast within these 10 minutes. So it, it, it's really, it, it, it's, there's a lot of different things that, 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 that's much more, uh, that's, that's in addition to this fairly simplified notion of elastic deformation that we use for tsunami source. So that's that's my sort of general answer. And Alec maybe we may actually add some more because <laughs> he's an expert in technology. <laughs> okay, uh, you know I don't see in the chat it's uh, an equation, but it's normally uh, I I have a question uh, and uh, comment and question. Actually, we always uh, when look at the some specific uh, I mean pure science we look also at some applications. And in your case, it is a direct application to the safe of life and uh, safe, safe, safe of uh, uh, their properties. Uh, well, it's the property is not so easy to save as, uh, but the uh, point is that today morning, we had another lecture related to the uh, volcanic 
ash propagation and uh, or clouds propagation. And uh, this is also, also discussed in terms of the data and the real the modeling of the specific parts of here. It's a source model, propagation model, and data insertion model, etc. But anyway, anyway, uh, there is my uh, understanding of your lecture was the following: that it's uh, we have a methods which can easily handle the problem. The point is time. And that's, uh, um, that's why we use as, uh, uh, let's say, <laughs> not as low as possible, but it's uh, as more available, uh, as available or more available data as possible. You know, it's uh, meaning, meaning you are not waiting when the full range of the data will be available, you can assimilate this data and generate a fantastic model. Because it is not the aim of such a modeling which needs to deliver information with a very short period of time. Uh, still, uh, you mentioned that it's a very important issue is a reduction of time related to the source. Uh, but here again, it uh, comes something which is uh, probably related to the first question we will discuss. If we know properly the area of source area, for example, in your cases uh, related to Japan, where the very close the subduction zone is, and if we will divide this subduction zone in some cells, let's say, speaking numerically, you know, and if we consider that it's uh, earthquake uh, with a magnitude eight and more can generate some dangerous waves, which is a one meter and higher. And in this case, is it possible probably to real generate the models, which will, uh, again, it's a coming to ensemble models, but, but not a truly ensemble models, but you mentioned it's a machine learning, for example, or, or this is a, you know, the artificial intelligence with the, using the pattern recognition, recognize this, uh, you know, this, uh, which object and um, what will be inundation and so on. And uh, this is a way now to think about this future or what is a real perspective right now, except of what you mentioned, that it's a just a shortening time uh, to determine the source. And what, mm -hmm. what is another also directions of thinking in the tsunami science? Uh, uh, what, what a good question. The, uh, the, uh, well, the, as you said, the timing is what make the problem so specific and, and difficult. It's not the timing per se is the problem. It's, it's that the fact that you have to come up with the inversion in such amount in a short amount of time. And, um, and it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because you, you're pretty much trying to find the balance between accuracy and speed. You can do very fast, but inaccurate. And you can do very accurate, but, but very, very, very slowly. <laughs> so you, you definitely want to combine these two. And, and in terms of the tsunami forecast, you know, real-time forecast, neither will work. You don't want fast and inaccurate. In fact, that was exactly the case in Japan. Uh, I mean, it was, they, they, they issued the warning in three minutes. It was underestimate of at least a factor of magnitude. It's just, uh, and that's, you know, created a set of slew of problems. Uh, you don't want that. Uh, uh, you, if you want, you don't want accurate forecast late. I mean, that's obviously you want it soon. So the 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 problem that we deal with is how to make this accurate forecast fast, and and that comes down to the data, uh, it's, and it it does come down to the data. Uh, you like I said, we are data poor problem for every particular source. There's only a few data points that you can work on. And that's why, but as you just mentioned, we imply so many different assumptions to sort of to, to substitute this data with a priori knowledge, right? right? It would be great to have the data instead because you know our a priori knowledge can be, you know. We, we, th we think we're smart, but we, we may not be that smart. The, the, the nature always outsmarts us. So it's, it's best to have the data available, a lot of amount of data. 
And Japan is doing this way, you know, is going this way. It's they are they are not looking back. They're spending a huge amount of money to instrument the coastline to the death, um, so to say. Um, but then that requires new algorithms also. So new data will bring new view of the tsunami inversion and machine learning is coming to mind. So far, we have at the very beginning of way and so far the results I've seen were sort of, you know, not, not overwhelming, but not underwhelming either. Uh, they mean they're sort of on par. So that's where I see, you know, there will be a lot more data coming soon into tsunami field. And we need new algorithms that deal with this data. That's, that's what you. I see. Yeah. Karim, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you very much, Vasily. That was really, really nice, really interesting. I mean, just using the, the words of uh, my friend Emil Okan that you, you know very well, even better than me. I mean, there are still, I mean, here, the quest of wisdom is quite positive to tell the truth. As far as far field staff are concerned, I think that, I mean, since the 2004 disaster, I think that far field is, is still encouraging, but maybe the near field is, is, is remains still an issue. Along the lines that Alik was a little bit discussing, I think that, I mean, this is something that you did not mention, but I'm sure that you're, you're, you're very positive about it, is the implementation of the omega or WD phase inversion in seismology mm -hmm. that, that has a, basically, I think that as far as developing counties are concerned, I mean, in the estimates of the magnitude, and uh, this has really a promising impact on far field tsunami warning. And uh, I, I see GNSS as, as, as the future, of course, but if you take a, an area like the Macron, I doubt that, that we will get permanent GPS stations distributed in Iran and Pakistan and with open data policy and all that stuff that would really allow us to do the right, the right work. And it, it seems to me that for the near field, I mean, when it goes to the most important contribution to the survival of people, Maybe education remains <laughs> remains the issue. I mean, I think that science is, is doing its best, but uh, I mean, we ICDP are, are very much focused on developing countries and we feel like uh, uh, open data policy and all this stuff are, are still an issue within the near field. Very good point, very good point, all agree. Uh, just maybe a few comments on on, on on a couple of those. The education, I mean, I, I haven't talked about the sort of tsunami warning as a system itself. But yes, I was talking only about one portion of it, which is forecast, yes, yes. Uh, which, uh, which is important, but, but, but cannot solve the problem by itself. Education is, is definitely key. However, I should say uh, that education is not also a silver bullet also. It, it all has to be in concert, if 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 we issue the warning and people don't know what to do, people die. If people know what to do but don't get the warning, and the warning can be the shaking, for example, this often, right. people die. It's only if it comes together when we have the perfect, I mean, sort of perfect in quotes, a good system where zero casualties from tsunami. So you, it, it has to be from both sides. Uh, Example from the, the, the there is a the, the tsunami in, in, in Nicaragua in uh, 1989 uh, uh, was the the example uh, sort of showing that you know ed education well it, it was not a silver bullet the, the the reason for people dying there was that nobody even felt the earthquake uh, and so it doesn't matter how educated people were uh, if they didn't feel the earthquake there was this unusually slow event. Which, which with very mild shaking, and that created huge tsunami. Uh, so you have to have all the components, ideally, ideally. Right. But if you if you go for the bank for the bank, education definitely is a, is a great way to start. <laughs> Absolutely agree, Vasily. It's not only uh, and Karim uh, <laughs> related to developing country, but also to develop country. Take a Germany, and it's a two hundred people that lost their life because of flooding. And why? Actually, it's because they were not educated. They were not informed about the, the possibility of the flooding, at the flash flooding at the, the region. But this is a really very important issue all over the world. There is not only to look at the basic science, which is a very important because it brings us a basic knowledge about the event, about this phenomenon, but also to educate people, even with that, we, we are always living with risk. 
We should not afraid that we are living with risk. Sometimes the policymakers go, no, don't tell people about it. Why not? We are living with risk, with virus and so on. We should know and should know how to really manage our life. And that is a really very good question. It's raised by uh, uh, the, 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 one of the, my really concern was when I saw that system, which you showed, why it is not much installed in the Atlantic Sea? What happens if the uh, 1755 Lisbon earthquake will come again? Yeah, a good question. And I don't have an answer to this. <laughs> uh, the, well, how how, the, how <laughs> select, selection occur with the dart? Well, I guess that's a risk management. You know, <laughs> the, you see the potential sources and you see, look at the Atlantic and you see there was just one event in the... In, uh, in the 19, it's, uh, uh, what, 1755, uh, you know, a couple more in the Carib Caribbean, uh, there are some events there, also yes. mostly prehistoric. So if you want to prioritize, you prioritize your your your, your funding into the uh, the Pacific, and that's what it, what had happened. But I mean, there was actually early this year there was a uh, earthquake in um, pretty big tsunami in Sandwich Island, which was gone completely unnoticed and almost undetected only because there was no people living there. But uh, it was a big tsunami. And actually it's, it's probably the first tsunami since 2004 that was detected in all three oceans. Uh, well, mm -hmm. all four oceans. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's in the Sandwich Islands is a very south of South America, like you know, next to Antarctica, very remote area, but can generate pretty big tsunami. And actually, I'm wondering what happened in South Africa, which should have seen pretty good waves actually from that. Uh, so yeah, you you you're right. Um, well, it's all uh, it's we we're struggling in science, and especially application and managing risk. That's where managing risk comes, you know, head up. Uh, you have to understand the risk, and and just like this example, I mean, this example from NASA. Encouraged me so much. You know, they they uh, uh, come up with the risk assessment from the meteor impact, which never occur. But but if when they occur, you can actually uh, measure the risk. It's a measurable measurable risk in terms of fatalities per year, and then you can start uh, you you can start you know sort of funding development and everything because it's needed for uh, for the detection uh, part. I see no further question. And uh, Vasily, I would like to thank you very much for uh, this uh, uh, excellent lecture. And it's, uh, we learned a lot. And indeed, it's uh, probably some uh, some some our uh, participants will also contact you with respect to the uh, papers or uh, particularly you mentioned about the meteor tsunami, which is a, which becomes a, it's quite important nowadays. Uh, and uh, at least at least it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the phenomena and to, to, to be understandable. Yeah. Uh, in some Karim, uh, you would like to. Yes, I, I have just an information. I think that yes. Vasily did really a very good overview. But I would like to invite the participant to check the website of ICTP where we had uh, recent workshops in which the physics of tsunamis was really tackled in uh, very much details by uh, both uh, Sinolakis and, uh, and Emilio Kahn. So you can find plenty of material uh, where you could see even the equations, you could see the development, you could see plenty of slides where uh, Vasily is appearing as well with, uh, with uh, all his contribution to tsunami sciences. And uh, please make use of this. I mean, you have videos there, you have a PDF of PowerPoints and feel free to use them. And uh, even the PowerPoint of Vasily will be available for, for everyone on the website. Yes. I think that with this, thank you very much, Vasily, and then we keep in touch. I hope that we will have time. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would like to remind you that tomorrow we will have a two uh, uh, sessions. Morning session will be given by Professor Fichtner from the Etihad Zurich about these uh, seismic inverse problems uh, with smart methods. It's truly smart. He is smart and his method also smart. <laughs> and the uh, next presentation will be in the early evening as today from 5 to 7 p.m. the uh, Central European uh, summer time. 
and it will be given by early career scientists by Gil Gwirz. I think he Gil, I saw I saw his. Oh yeah, he's still here. Could you open your uh, uh, video? Oh hi, hi Gil. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and Gil will give a, a presentation related to the understanding predicting of geomagnetic secular variations with, uh, with data simulation. Okay, great. This is a short announcement about the tomorrow uh, events. And now, good evening and good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Thanks. <laughs> okay, bye-bye then. Bye-bye.